Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Gospel of St. John will serve as our sermon meditation this morning. It's recorded for us in the 15th chapter, beginning at verse 1. Jesus speaking says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. These are the words of our text. Please be seated. In the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, dear Christian friends, are you connected to the right vine? This past week I was reading an article about a rare dinosaurus find in the country of Chile. Fernando, one of the paleontologists, named the dinosaur Chilisaurus for obvious reasons. And the article went on to say that what makes this find so bizarre is what it teaches us about evolution. You see, in Fernando's mind, and other paleontologists that observed Chilisaurus, they believe that what they saw in this dinosaur was that missing link that proves the process of evolution that species cross over into other species because it was such a bizarre looking dinosaur. You see, in Fernando's mind, this would prove everything about what this so-called God says in the book of Genesis wrong. You see, if indeed we can prove that species cross over, then everything that God said in the Genesis account is hogwash. And if everything God said in Genesis is hogwash, then why would you trust anything else the Bible says? It's a big discovery in the mind of Fernando. Because Fernando, like many in this world, they are clinging to a vine that will dissipate like a vapor at the moment of death. There's no security in a secular worldview. What vine are you attached to for your life? The popular position of American thought is this. Well, if I am faithful in my duties, whether I'm a husband or a wife, a mother or a father, if I am faithfully providing for my family, living, making a livable wage, and doing the things that I need to do in society, keeping my nose clean, if there is a place called judgment and hell, Popular American philosophy says this, it can't be reserved for someone like me because there's a whole host of other people that are far worse than me. Uh, For instance, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Bernie Madoff. Even if there's a hell, it's got to be reserved for the ugliest of society, right? 
that too is a vine that will dissipate at the moment of death because as the great wise King Solomon said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death, eternal death. You know, the Bible teaches us, King Solomon in the Ecclesiastes says that God has placed eternity inside of every human being. Which might just be the reason why we see some differences between human beings than we see in the world we call the animal kingdom. Not so? You guys familiar with bears? You see, when a bear gives birth to a cub, the mama bear protects those cubs. Why? Because the father bear, if left unchecked, will eat the cub. Now, I know it doesn't make any sense, but that's where mother bear comes in and defends from the father. Doesn't make a lot of sense. I would blame it on the sinful world that we live in. I don't think it was always meant to be that way, but true story. Now, Let's just suppose Father Bear gets his way and destroys his cubs. Do you see a whole host of other bears coming in to arrest Papa Bear, put him into prison, and say, hey, we lock up people like this in society because you know what? We got ground rules. No, of course not. So then why, when someone decides to kill their own child, why do we put him in prison? Why are we guided by a moral guide and a conscience and fish are not? Is that something that evolved to? You see, the Bible says God has placed inside of the heart of every man eternity, which gives to man this idea that there's something more after this life. What it is, I may not know, but there's something. God knows. I know. And the Bible teaches us what vine are you clasping onto? You see, in America today, and we see it too often in the church, we have what are called these self-made men. People who want to be independent of their creator. The very thing we are told about Adam and Eve in the garden, they wanted to be independent of their creator. And we see that play out in civilization every day, don't we? I don't want some archaic book to restrict me in how I want to live my life. I don't want a moral guide of, of absolutes, which in itself kind of doesn't make sense because if you don't have moral absolutes, you don't need police. And if you don't need police, well, we can just have chaos. And if I want to rob a bank, I can rob a bank. Or if I want to murder someone, I can murder someone. So it's kind of an inconsistent philosophy when you stop and think about it because we do want moral absolutes, but we just don't want the kind that are guided by our God. And I don't need the church or any man dressed in a white dress to tell me how to live my life. What vine do you cling to in life? Because a lot of people cling to that independence vine but that too will dissipate at the moment of death. There was a man by the name of Lee Strobel, an award-winning legal journalist for the Chicago Tribune, and also, no surprise, an atheist. He had a very devout Christian wife, and still does, and uh, the children in the home were also raised with mom's faith, and it was starting to cause a little tension in the home because Lee couldn't figure out the superstitions of Christianity, why people pray to some unknown entity, and uh, why they have to go to church and, and do all of these things. And, and so what he decided to do, since um, he was kind of at a loss as to why his wife and children were doing these things, he decided on the Chicago Tribune's dime, smart man, he decided to set out and disprove the historicity of Jesus Christ so that he could come back with verifiable evidence that Jesus not only never existed, but he certainly didn't rise from the dead. And so on Chicago Tribune's dime, he flew over several occasions over to Jerusalem and Judea, and he, and he toured, and he had rabbi after rabbi. You know, rabbis deny Jesus Christ. They don't believe in him either. They believe in the historicity of him, but they don't believe he rose from the dead. 
And in his search to disprove Christ, you, should, you can watch the movie on Netflix, a documentary on Lee Strobel, or read his book. It's pretty interesting. In his position to disprove Christ, the Holy Spirit actually transformed his heart. And he came to believe that not only is he a historical person, not only did he really die on a cross, but he rose on the third day to prove his victory over death. Something that no man has the solution over. What vine do you cling yourself to in this life? What philosophy, what secular worldview have you embraced? There's only one vine that will save you, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know in our text today, in John chapter 15, you know how many times Jesus says the word remain? In five verses, verses 3 through 8, Jesus says the word remain eight times. Remain in me and I'll remain in you. The word remain is a present active imperative, simply meaning this. It's a command. And you know what that command does to my heart? It brings me both conflict and comfort. And let me explain why. It brings conflict to my heart first and foremost because... I look back on 42 years of living and I look at all the times in life where I doubted the promises of God to take care of me, to take care of my family, uh, to take care of financial needs, to take care of uh, problems that I had in life. I look at all the times as I look back on life and say, I didn't always remain in you, dear Jesus. Sometimes I trusted my own solutions to the problems that I had in life. Sometimes I tried to figure my way out of a jam instead of just falling back in your arms, praying to you, and trusting you. I know you tell me to cast all my anxieties upon you, but oftentimes you've been the last resort, Lord, because a lot of times I like to figure out my own problems in life. Does that explain you too? Does it bring conflict to your soul when Jesus says, remain in me and I will remain in you? Because if you don't, you're like a branch that withers. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 said, the good that I would, I do not, and the evil I do not, this I keep on doing. Paul was conflicted in his heart because he knew he had this desire that wanted to please God. He even wanted to please himself, but he couldn't even live up to his own expectations, much less this holy God's expectations of him. And so he says, what a wretched man I am. Who's going to rescue me from this body of death? Have you ever felt conflicted? Jesus commands you to remain in him, but sometimes... Jesus is the last resort in your life. You know, I think when we consider the timing of our text, it might help us understand this fact. Jesus doesn't say remain in me because he wants to bring conflict to your soul. Jesus says remain in me because he wants to comfort your soul. Let's consider the timing for a moment. Jesus is in the upper room less than 12 hours away from being crucified. He knows it. His disciples didn't really know it at the time. But he does. He's God. And you'd say within the last 12 hours of a man's life, those are going to be some pretty important words to say, aren't they? Last will and testament. So he's having one of those intimate conversations with, shall we call his children. He wants to bring them comfort because in less than 12 hours, he's going to have the appearance of a very impotent man. They are going to witness the one who gave sight to the blind be blindfolded by the authorities and beaten again and again and again. They are going to see him who cast out demons, resurrected the dead, walked on the water, and fed the 5,000. They are going to witness him to look like an impotent human being, no different than any of us. They bind him hand and feet. They torture him and crucify him on a cross, and they are going to be puzzled. I thought this was our Savior. I thought he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. 
Jesus knew that their hearts were going to be perplexed by what they were about to see because they didn't fully understand the cross and its purpose. Jesus wasn't helpless in the matter. He came into the world with a distinct purpose to die by execution on a cross. I Isaiah, in, you know, Isaiah in the 53rd chapter, which is written 700 years before Christ and 400 years before crucifixion was even invented, Isaiah wrote all about his crucifixion in the 53rd chapter. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. They didn't fully understand it at the time, but they needed to understand the message of the cross. Dear friends in Christ, we all need to understand this message of the cross because when Jesus came into this world, he came to represent the real sin that makes you feel really guilty in this life, the sin that you carry in your life because of decisions you've made in the past, poor judgments you made, unkind words laziness, call it whatever it is, greed, selfishness, it doesn't matter. It infiltrates every one of our hearts. When Paul says the good I would, I do not, the evil I do not, this I keep on doing, Paul now has a solution for the evil inside his own heart. It's Christ. And so do you and I. When Jesus says remain in me, he's simply saying remain in that cross and its message because he comes in to bear our sin. What Jesus did in essence was this. The Father sent his only begotten to represent human beings. That's why he had to be born of a virgin woman. He had to be truly human. But he wasn't just human. He was also true God, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Interesting side note, the Muslims actually believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. It's kind of interesting. It's about the only thing they get right, but they do get that one right. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. He couldn't just be human because a human being can't die for another human being and spare their life unless, of course, they're holy and perfect and no human being is holy and perfect. See, I could die for you for maybe a few years of your life, jump on a grenade for you, but that's about it. That's all I could do. Jesus had to be true God so that his sacrifice on that cross could count for all mankind. And so what God did in essence was, I'm going to put all of the sin and the guilt that every human being experiences, I'm going to put it all upon you, my beloved son, and I'm going to let you walk resolutely to Jerusalem. You know how many times in the Gospels Jesus predicts that he's going up to Jerusalem to die? He didn't come into this world to teach you how to be good little boys and girls. He came to die for bad little boys and girls, for you and me. That is the message of the Christian faith that Christ comes to be the vine that gives you life because now we're forgiven of our sins. Now we can stand before this holy God. Remember, you can't even live up to your own expectations. I know this. I can't live up to my own expectations either. And I know you can't live up to God's expectations. But through faith in Jesus Christ, God accepts you for who you are. Warts and all. Scabs and all. And he now says, you're my precious son, my precious daughter. And Jesus is simply saying, remain in me because it's the only way life doesn't come to an end for you. Remain in my love. Remain in my word. Remain in the sacrament that I institute. Oh, by the way, that was the same night he was saying, remain in me. He now institutes a blessed and sacred meal and says, in with and under, with my body and blood comes the forgiveness of your sins. You know, this past week, my grandfather died at 93 years young. I got to see him about a week ago, uh, his other grandson up in the balcony. It was, it was a really special moment because we knew that life was expiring on him and so we got to say our goodbyes to him from this earthly life, have a devotion with him, pray with him. And, and I knew that, you know, with the gasping of breath that it probably wasn't going to be months. Maybe it was going to be weeks, but probably it was going to be days. And so fully expecting to hear that Grandpa had gone the way of eternity. And uh, I got the text on either Wednesday or Thursday morning. Um, Grandpa has gone to be with Jesus at 5.30 this morning. And 
even though you expect things like this, it still jolts you. I mean, 93, I mean, 93 is a long life by human standards. That's like 18 for a dog, right? But it still rattles you to the core, doesn't it? Even when you want them to go be with Jesus, even when you, you don't want them to suffer here on this life. I mean, he was heading into a nursing home, and it's such a blessing, but it's still, when you get that little text message, and to my mother's credit, she was texting a lot of family members, and so it was a lot easier to send out one mass media message than to call each person. It still kind of rattles you. That's what death is supposed to do. It's supposed to rattle human beings. It's supposed to remind us that we are mere mortals. It's supposed to remind us that sin presents real problems for you and me that needs real solutions for you and me. Chilisaurus ain't getting you anywhere in life, <laughs> okay? Jesus Christ is. He is the vine that transforms life here on earth and brings life for all eternity where he promises never again will there be sickness or sorrow, death or mourning, or even a tear, unless it's a tear of joy. He holds that out to you and me and simply says, my children, remain in me. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it guard, may it keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Jesus. Amen.